Greetings, friends. I hope you're all doing well. It's been a uh, it's been a very different summer, I guess, for most of us, with the virus, the political situation, uh, many other things that are going on in our nation and the world at the, at this time. And my prayer is, and it is, and it's been hard for me and my family as well, is to stay focused on the things that God is saying to His church in this time. There are many there are many distractions. And um, I pray we're not getting caught up in those things. God has a plan for us, for the church. And we're on a journey. And that's kind of what I want to look at today. I've done this study uh, in a much abbreviated form at our church a couple years ago. And I've done it ex more expanded on the website. In fact, I think I'm just getting done with the last part from the 1 Corinthians 10 study. And this is what I want to look at. And this, again, this ties in with the gospel. I know I started a gospel series recently, went through a couple parts on that, and, and this is part of it as well, because what is our goal? What is the purpose that we're here? I believe there's a journey that we're on, and I just want to start today. I'm looking at this, it, it, I'm going to kind of read some of the stuff that I've posted on the website from the study, and I want to expound on it a little bit. And if you have any questions or comments, please contact me. If you know me personally, you've probably got my phone number or my email, or you can uh, respond to the website or uh, wherever I post this. And that would be fantastic. I would love to get some dialogue going with this. And uh, I'm just going to start off by reading the portion that we're going to cover over the next probably few videos um, from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and from the New King James Version. And this is Paul writing to the church, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Verse 6, Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our abnimition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. That's what this first part is about. I entitled it on the website, Examples. The, Paul's writing this to the church. He's writing it to us. And he's saying that these things that happened to God's people then are examples for us that we need to heed. We need to hear this message. If Paul wrote it to the church, in fact, he wrote it that says, um, at the beginning of the letter, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's us. That includes us. Yes, it was written to that church at that time. But it was written for future generations as well. To all who are called to be saints. And I believe that, in that includes all of us who are watching this video right now. The we sense that God has called us to something. And... We want to know what that something is. What has the Lord Jesus laid hold of me for? We know that was Paul's aim and uh, his goal in Philippians chapter 3, to lay hold of all that Christ Jesus had laid hold of him for. So what has he laid hold of us for? What is this journey that we're on? And look what these people experienced back then. It says that they were saved, they were baptized, they partook of Christ, and they followed the cloud in the fire. They had... In one sense, and we're going to go over this in the coming weeks, and I pray that God reveals things to each one of us as we do. 
that they had the same that we have now. They had the Spirit. They partook of Christ. Yes, Jesus had not yet come yet. We're, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead. I, I don't want to jump ahead. But they had every opportunity to enter into the fullness of the promises of God, just as we have the opportunity now. And they were given all things that pertain to life and godliness to help them on that journey. Yet God was not pleased with many of them. In fact, with most of them, it says. Is God pleased with us? God has given us all that we need to complete the journey. But will we complete it? One of the unfortunate parts of our religion today, the Christian religion, is that we're taught that these things are already ours. And that we don't really have to press through on the journey. Did that happen to these individuals? When Moses came and Aaron came and spoke to the elders of Israel, the people of Israel, they told them that God is giving you the land of Canaan. God is bringing you to a place. God is going to do this. This land is yours. But yet most of them didn't attain it. So when we go through whatever we do in church to get quote-unquote saved, and, and we begin our walk, and then we're, now we're told by the pastor or the priest or whatever that heaven is ours or the kingdom of God is ours, all the promises of God are ours. Well, are they? I believe the opportunity to attain them is, is there, just as it was for these individuals. But if we don't walk the walk, if we don't heed the word of God and follow his instruction along the way, what does it say here? Most of them were destroyed. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. We will not attain. Again, I'm jumping ahead. Dear Lord, help me to present something that's going to be an encouragement to the saints. Even if it sounds contrary, Lord, to what we have known, perhaps, and what we want in our hearts, what our Adamic nature would desire, help us to receive your truth, Lord because it will strengthen us. Praise your name. So we do well to heed these words. All the letters of the apostles were written to us here in the 21st century just as much as, as, as they were written to them back um, in the 1st century. In fact, as it says here, that this was written for those upon the end of the ages, or the fulfillment of the ages has come. I, and I believe, we look around us in the world today, friends, and we see the upheaval that's going on. And, and I personally, I look at the timeline of things, and we're entering, we're getting close to the third day, if you, will, if you look at a thousand years being a, a, as one day. So I believe the fulfillment is drawing near, and even if it's still a thousand years from now, we're ever drawing near to the end. So these things were written for our, our example, or for, as examples for us as well to heed. Praise your name. Praise your holy name. So this that Paul wrote here, I can see as our salvation journey, the walk of the way, the walk in, in, in our wilderness. Again, we've been taught that we get it all at the beginning when we're saved. Israel was saved. Jude says the same thing, that, that Israel was saved and yet God ended up, he, killed, he says he killed most of them. Oh, Father, I want us to attain to the fullness of the promise of God. Praise your name. So the things that Paul wrote that were examples for us, it's all Old Testament. That's all that Paul had back then. There was no New Testament yet. In fact, Paul wrote about half the New Testament. So we cannot dismiss anything that took place in the Old. Without the Old Testament, friends, there would be no New Testament. Jesus is the beginning of the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. We know, and we've looked at this in, in prior videos, that there are many, many, many things that have not yet been fulfilled or come to fruition that were prophesied concerning the Christ in the Old Testament. Jesus fulfilled a whole bunch of those, and he began, he's the firstborn of many brothers. He's the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn of creation. That means there's others to come after him. I've got some other friends that, that, that speak a lot about this, um, as well. And the rest, I believe, the rest of these prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the Christ, which is Christ's head and body, will be fulfilled 
When the body of Christ comes to maturity, Jesus has done his part. Will we do ours? So that with Jesus and Christ as the full head and body, the anointed of God, all of these prophecies will come to pass. Oh, praise your name. Praise your holy name. What God began with Abraham and even Noah when God chose him and even Adam in the garden is still being played out. We who have accepted God's call and surrendered to Jesus Christ are brought into his family, into the Israel of God, that royal priesthood that the scripture talks about in both testaments. And I'll, I'll put some links below. And this is, again, this is on the website. All that we have in the scripture is to help us along the path God desires to lead us on. There, there is no other way. And I use that capital. That's what the Christianity um, was called that it was called the way it, w it was the way of the cross it was the way jesus was, f was following the way he was the one he led the way to the cross and we must follow that same pattern that same path and we have many examples uh, throughout including godly men and women who heeded his instruction as well as others who began the journey yet turned away from the lord and also those who refused to obey or know him at all We have examples of godly individuals in the scripture. God had told Noah, Abraham, others, to walk before him, to be perfect. It says of Enoch that he walked with God. We know Elijah and Elisha, they stood before the Lord God. Moses talked with God face to face as a man talks with his friend. There were godly people in the Old Testament, and there are godly people in the New Testament. And I believe there are godly people, and I pray that we're striving to be among them on the earth today and throughout the centuries. Those who heed this word. And then there are those who received it initially, yet when things got hard, they, they turned away. We know uh, many of Jesus' disciples in John chapter 6. It says when, the, when, the, when he was teaching them, got too hard for them. They left, it says, his disciples. They were disciples of his. They followed him no more. So they started off on the path, but they turned away. And same, it's the same as Israel in the wilderness. They stood before the mountain of God at one point, and the word of God came forth, and they, and they, they said, we will do all that the Lord our God has commanded us. And then, before you know it, they're giving in to to sexual immorality, they're following other foreign gods, they're sacrificing to idols, all these types of things. When the going got hard, when the, when the water was scarce, instead of trusting on God, relying upon Him, appreciating the manner that He provided, they complained and they whined, and then God had their bodies strewn in the wilderness. They did not receive the, what was promised to them. Will we, will we receive what has been promised to us? Or will we end up falling away? We, Hebrews says we are not of those who shrink back unto, the, unto destruction. He's encouraging us in that. Praise your name. Peter reminds us that because of sin, God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. And this is Peter writing this in the New Testament. So afterwards, so all those after Sodom and Gomorrah should look back at that and realize what was the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, there were, some, there were a lot of sexual um, immorality that was going on, but there were other things as well. They were walking in, in the imagination of their own heart. They were, they were um, following their own lusts and desires. They were doing things their way and not according to God's way. So what came upon them was destruction. And this is an example to anyone who would live like that, whether we call ourselves a Christian or not. That's one thing, friends, we have got to get away from. We have got to realize that just because we call ourselves a Christian does not mean that the warnings of God don't apply to us anymore. They actually apply more to us, I believe, than they do to the world. Because the world doesn't know. Those who are living out there, and you can see them all over the place, on most of the Hollywood uh, situations, they, they don't know. 
They may hear people yell things at them about this, that, and the other thing, or God hates this and that, but they really don't know. They're living according to things that make them happy. But we, who have made a confession of Christ, who have begun the journey, the walk, and who know that these things are wrong, if we are running into them, we face a greater danger than those in the world. Uh, Jesus said in, in, uh, in Luke, those who knew and did such things will receive few stripes, but those who knew, which, which is only Christians, those who knew the commands of God and did the same things that the, those in the world did are going to receive a greater punishment. I, I, I don't know how we've gotten away from that. I, I don't know how well we got there, Lord, but I believe that's one of the tests of, the, of, of this going to separate the, um, the saints in these end days, the saints from the churchgoers, because they're not the same thing. Dear Jesus, praise your name. Praise your holy name. This is a warning to us here today, as it has been true throughout the ages. Living ungodly is to live walking on a path different from the one that God has laid before us. And Jesus taught us that the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And, there are, and those who find it are few. I know we've, we've, we make being saved a very easy thing. And, and, and we've looked at this in other videos. I believe, yes, getting saved is, is easy. In fact, Jesus won salvation for all on the cross. And then we can enter into it by confession. That's the beginning. That's not the end. The way to life few are going to find that now that few that the rest of those doesn't mean they're going to go to hell the, what, what this what this few is is are those who are going to be united with christ in that day john 17 who become one with him as he is with the father those who actually enter into all the promises of god and are now life-giving spirits they they're sitting on the throne with christ bringing life and restoration healing to the nations and, that, and that, that's another, I, I've, I've got to do a video on that. I, there's the three groups. There's the lost, who, who, who are going to be excluded from God's kingdom. There's those who are welcomed into God's kingdom, which is the most. And then the few are God's kingdom. Those are the first resurrection saints. Oh, Jesus, do we feel that, that call? Do we just want to be saved and go sit on a cloud in heaven? And have no more death or taxes? Or do we actually want to be one who's going to rule with Christ on his throne over the rest of the nations? The people bringing life to those who were abused and had no hope in this life. Jesus. Jesus. Those who don't know their right hand from their left. Oh, praise your name. Deuteronomy 5.32 Therefore, you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the left or to the right. We're without excuse if God has called us. To be saved and become a disciple of Christ carries far greater responsibility to repent and live righteously than it does to those in the world. As we go through the Bible, study God's word, we find the bulk of the commands, friends, to repent are to the church. Just look at Revelation. They're given to the church, not to the world. And to God's elect, rather than, the, than to the sinners living in the world. Yes, we have Jonah, and we have Nahum. There are some of those in the Old Testament where God would send an individual, one of Israel, into another nation and preach repentance to them. But the far and wide, the greater call to repentance is to those that God has called into his kingdom. And especially in, in uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, when God is speaking directly to the churches and telling them of the promises, if they will overcome, he says to them, repent. We are not going to overcome by a mere belief. I know there's one verse they take out of context in, in, uh, in John and exclude hundreds of other passages. But to believe is not to overcome. To obey and to repent and to love not our life unto the death, that is to repent. It, it is to overcome. Oh, Jesus, praise your name. The book of Hebrews, we find the exhortation to remain on the path that God has laid before us until the end. And a warning as well, not to fall as many did, whom the Lord had saved from Egypt. And I believe that's saved from bondage as well. He said, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, 
to the rest of God, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. And he's talking about the things that Paul spoke on, those who followed their own lusts, those who complained. And friend, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of complaining over the next uh, probably couple, at least a year or two after, after this election is over. There's going to be many on both sides complaining about the results, um, complaining about this, that, and the other thing. I found myself complaining about some of these restrictions from this virus situation, and and uh, I, I I don't want to live by my human nature anymore. I want to put that to death. I want to put the deeds of my human nature to death, and I want to nourish the seed of Christ that is in me, so that that comes to the forefront, and that is what my family, my the those around me, what God sees, the angels see. Is, is that seed of Christ, that the nature of, of Jesus coming to maturity in me. Paul said that he travailed in birth so that Christ would be formed in us. Is Christ being formed in me by complaining and whining about the situations that I have no control over? No, that's keeping my old man alive. He needs to go. I need to nourish that seed of Christ that's within me. Praise your name. Praise your name. These were setting an example. Those in Israel, and us today by the things we do, were setting an example not only for their children, but for the nations around them. When we're living godly lives, and in fact, Peter says you can hasten the coming of the day of God by living a godly life. If I'm living righteously, I'm going to affect my family, my immediate family, but I'm going to affect those around me. And I'm going to affect those I can't even know. I, did, I, I can't even see. Because God can do things through individuals who are living godly lives, regardless of whether that individual himself knows it. I believe we do far greater good as individuals when we're obeying the will of God, following Jesus, laying down our life, picking up our cross, offering ourselves as a, as a living sacrifice. We're doing far greater good for humanity, for God's creation, than we are if we gather thousands together and do a march or a protest or even a big prayer meeting. If we're not living the godly lives in private in our homes and walking in repentance and submission before the Lord God Almighty, those big prayer marches are going to do absolutely nothing. Jesus, we can get in our face wear sackcloth, we can talk about repentance all day long. But if we're actually not, not actually turning away from sin, which is repentance is, it's not a mental assent, it's not a mental belief or a changing of the mind, it may begin there, but if it is not followed up by action, it means absolutely nothing in the eyes of God. Jesus. God's going to know this nation has repented, or the church, I'm going to say, has repented, when we stop sinning. Oh, Jesus, praise your holy name. Little did they know back then that the impact their decisions would have. God had given his people Israel instruction along with his salvation as they began their journey out of Egypt. Back here, let, let me read from Le Leviticus 18, 1-5. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live. And you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and my laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. Can, can we believe this? So if God has called us out of the world... He's telling us, don't live as the world does anymore. And the interesting thing is here, he says, in the place that I'm bringing you, don't live as they do. And that's another entire topic. And I believe that this plays in very well with some of the things that I've shared on, um, on the first resurrection and, and the end times and what the goal of God is, which is to take the place of those who usurped God's authority and now have the reign in the heavens. That is where God is bringing us. Don't do as they do. If God is bringing us, friends, saints 
elect. If God is bringing us to a place where there are those who, he says now, don't do as they do, that, that's not heaven. That's the air, the, the prince of the power of the air. I knew I was going to get sidetracked here. In 1 Thessalonians, when it says they meet the Lord in the air, he's, ta he's taking them, first resurrection saints, us if we make it, I pray we do, he's going to bring us up to a place where there are those who are, who are seated now who do not follow God's ways, who have usur usurped his authority. They are going to be dethroned. When God took Israel into Egypt, he told them to, it was a judgment against the gods. I mean, I'm sorry, when he took them to, into Canaan, it was a judgment against the gods in Canaan. First, he judged the gods in Egypt. He's judging the gods of, of, of this world. Then he's taking them to a place where they were supposed to inherit eternally. And they were supposed to be a light from that location, from, from the land of Canaan. It was going to become the land of Israel. But there were those seated there who are not of God. There are those seated in the heavenlies now. As it says, our, our, uh, Paul says in Ephesians 6, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against these rulers and principalities in the heavens. The heavenlies. Not heaven in the sense that we think of heaven, but in that realm that has authority over the earth. That is where Christ is coming to bring the first resurrection saints. And he's telling us, don't do as they do. Because what they did when they rebelled against God at the beginning, they rebelled against him. And they brought the, the corruption to the earth and to creation. And God is going to strip them of their authority. And he's going to replace them with the first resurrection saints who are conformed to the image of Christ in this life. And they are going to have the rule over, over God's creation. They are going to rule the nations. They are going to inherit the nations. Those who sit there now are going to be dethroned. And those who overcome in this life are going to take their place. Praise your name. So God is bringing us to a place where he says, don't do as they do. Oh, Jesus, I, I, I could go way off on that. Um, and perhaps I may. And if you have any questions popping up in your head right now, or, or even some form of clarity, please uh, let me know. Write to me. Call me. Um, the proverb, heed instruction and be wise. Do not neglect it. Had they heeded his instruction back then and not neglected the salvation, then our passage, Paul's writing here, 1 Corinthians 10, would be much different. But as it was, the children of Israel seemed to continually waver between looking longingly back to Egypt and embracing the traditions of the pagan nations around them. Are we looking fondly back at that which God has set us free from? Are we compromising with the things of this world? Do we find our eyes wandering around and our feet turning to the left or to the right? As a whole, the example they left for us is a model of what not to do. The nation, Israel back then, they, they lost their inheritance. They compromised, indulging in and practicing the things God had warned them not to partake of that were done in Egypt and in the land of Canaan. Are we keeping our feet on the path that will lead to our inheritance? It's not easy. It's not easy, friends, to let go of things that we have become comfortable with and, again, that we identify with. I'm of this nationality. I'm, I'm of this persuasion. I'm of this whatever. And then we have things we bring along with us. And God wants us. God understands. He made us unique. And there are certain things, but we have characteristics to, that he wants to enhance in us. And it may be some of the things that we like and treasure, <clears throat> but we have to be willing to let them go and allow him to work in us, his will and his way. Jesus, praise your name. However, not all back then made bad choices. We know Joshua and Caleb were able to come into the land 
There were Old Testament prophets and New Testament apostles that did give us a good pattern to follow. Again, we're looking at examples here. As a whole, we have Israel as an example of what not to do. And then I pray that we find those in the scripture who were good examples and follow them as they followed Christ. From James, do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. A lot of these apostles, I mean, a lot of these prophets, yeah, the apostles as well, but the prophets in the Old Testament and, uh, and Job and others, they had to endure a lot. They had to have, they suffered a lot. And they had patience to endure. I, again, I mentioned this earlier, um, another time. Joshua and Caleb, they were in the, they had gone into the promised land as spies. They actually got to see what God was giving them. They came back and said, God is giving us this land. And the other ten guys got scared. They were afraid. They went along with the crowd. They, it, the giants are too big. We can't overtake them. They didn't believe God. I think a lot of times we don't believe the promises of God either. And the things that are required to attain them. Praise your name. Anyway, so Joshua and Caleb came back. Then they had to wait another 38 and a half years before they actually got to go into the land. They had to endure knowing for all that time that they were faithful and they missed out at that time what was theirs because of everybody else. It would have been so easy to become bitter toward their fellow um, citizens of Israel because they were made to wait all those years, almost four decades, before they got the promise. That was some suffering and endurance in that, in, for them. And then a lot of the prophets, we know Jeremiah was thrown in, in the dungeons a couple times. Other guys went through horrendous things, persecutions, because they preached the word of God. And even in the face of persecution, even knowing that the moment they spoke a, a truth, they were going to be punished. Micaiah, when he came before Jehoshaphat and Ahab, and he was thrown in prison. Um, Ahab said until he got back, Ahab was killed. So did Micaiah spend the rest of his life in prison? Perhaps, we don't know. But the, but the thing is, it didn't matter. Even when he was faced with that, he still spoke the truth of God. Are, are, are we, will we be able to speak the truth of God in the face of no matter what goes on around us? Jesus, we don't have the persecution yet the way that some of these guys did, but it's coming, friends. It really is. And it's in part to other parts of the world right now. You go to Pakistan, Tajikistan, some of, the, some of those other countries, um, and you can speak the word of God and, and be killed or burned out of your home. Praise your name. <clears throat> yeah, the, the, uh, Paul wrote of himself and his fellow laborers in sharing the gospel. He encouraged the saints to join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. And that's from uh, Philippians 3.17. And this is right after Paul goes into his, I have not yet attained, but I'm pressing on. And he speaks of his goal in that. Again, which was not to get raptured, to go to heaven, or anything like that. that that's not Bible. Paul says his goal, his aim, was to share in the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ. And to be conformed. In fact, let me, let me read that. I, I read this often, but I think this is vital for us today especially in these times in which we're living. We're going to need to know what Paul's goal was because this needs to be our goal as well. This is from the, uh, this is from the, uh, the Holman. Praise your name. Praise your holy name. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that somehow, somehow, I will reach the resurrection from among the dead. And again, I believe he's talking about the first resurrection here. Because he knew everybody's going to be resurrected. Everybody gets resurrected at one point. But there's a first resurrection coming. Those who have been conformed to Christ, they will be raised in his likeness. 
because they've purified themselves in this life. Praise your name. And then again in the next verse, not that I have already reached the goal. So he knew that it wasn't his yet. Or I'm already fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by, by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, reaching forward to what is ahead. And I pursue that goal, that upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then that's when he says, follow his example and others as a pattern. That's the example we are to follow. Are we following that example? And we know the, 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 uh, the, what Jesus said. Again, de deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow him if we would come after him. Yes, 1 Corinthians 11. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I know it says in another place that we are to walk as he walked. Oh, Jesus, praise your name. We do well to follow the example of those men and women who kept their eyes fixed on Jesus and the end intended by the Lord. Again, that was written of Job. So there was an end that God had in mind for Job. Now, what if Job would have complained along the way? And what if he would have cursed God? Would he have been restored? Would he still have been given all, the, all these new children that he had? And his crop and, his, and all these things? And would he have been able to pray for his friends and be a blessing to them? No. Just because God intended that to be the end for Job does not mean it's going to happen. God has an end intended for the church. We know that that end is going to happen for the church as a whole. But us as individuals, it will not happen unless we follow the example laid forth in, in, in the scripture. If we're doing the things that we need to do, if we're not following the example and we're walking in disobedience, it doesn't matter what God has intended for us. It will not come to pass. Jesus did his part, friends. Yes, absolutely. But we must do ours. Praise your name. Jesus will not bear our cross for us. I know the song sings that, but that's 100% opposite what the Bible says. Jesus, praise your name. If we do not pick up our cross and follow him, Jesus said we're not worthy of him. We must pick up our cross. What he has, what he has laid hold of us for is what we must lay hold of, and we must grasp that. We must receive it, say, if this is the end, or if, if this is the way of the journey that God has for me, that I must embrace this, that I may see the, that I may attain to the end that God has set before me. Praise your name. Oh, Jesus. Moses. Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for they looked to the reward. Moses was a man who had, who had everything. And however God revealed it to him, that the Israelites were his people, somehow he discovered that. The scripture doesn't really talk too much about that, but he, at some point he, he recognized that he was an Israelite. And he gave up what he had, all the riches and the power and everything authority he had in Egypt as a ruler, and went to suffer with the people of God instead. That was some endurance there. He had to go through some, in, some crazy things. But God, look what God did with him. He made him a deliverer. God is looking to do that with his, with, with his elect today. His church with a capital C. Not the whole church. The church with a small c, the Christian religion, is trying to go about setting creation free on their own, on their own terms. That's not going to happen. That's like when Moses went out and killed the Egyptian. He was trying to set his people free on his terms. That's not going to work. That will never work. God will, God will not ha allow that to happen. It has to be done God's way. So all that the church is trying to do today with its programs and its marches and causes and all that, they're going to fall short. They will not achieve God's purposes. Those who are surrendered, those who go through the journey of testing and, and, and pass and make it through the 40 years that, Mo, that Moses did, the 40 days that Jesus 
the man himself had to go through before he could even begin his ministry of ministering to people and setting people free. If Moses would have fell, he would not have been the deliverer. If Jesus would have succumbed in the wilderness the 40 days, he would not have set God's people free. He could not have been that sacrifice for us. And if God's elect now and throughout the ages, if we try to do it on our own, and we don't follow that path that God has for us, we will not be among those who set creation free in eternity. Praise your name. And receive the promises of chapters um, 2 and 3 in Revelation. Oh, Jesus. We have the example set by Lord, by our Lord Jesus Christ to follow. As he says in John 13, 15, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. You know, this was a foot washing thing, but it was his example throughout his ministry, how he ministered to people, how he warned people, how he taught and instructed his disciples. And then in 1 Peter 2, 21, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem, knowing what lay before him. And he stayed on that course, knowing that it was going to lead to his death. Are we staying on the course that God has set before us, knowing it's going to lead to our, the death of our human nature, but life in Christ Jesus? Again, suffering. Yes, friends, there's always going to be some suffering involved. It's painful. It may not be physically painful, but it, it could be emotionally um, Mentally, there's some pain involved in letting go of things that our Adamic nature would rather cling to. Relinquishing control of our lives to Jesus is hard. Transferring our trust and security and money to God is not easy. Facing the reality that some of our activities are displeasing to our Heavenly Father can be very uncomfortable to our Adamic nature. Praise your name. But it is through suffering and the chastening of God that we are changed from glory to glory and transformed into the image of his Son. Remember that Jesus himself was made perfect through suffering. Our perfect example, Jesus, endured through suffering and persecution, remaining faithful to God and to his plan, God's plan. He endured through every temptation and did not sin. He could have, but he didn't. Praise your name. Uh, I've heard people use the phrase, what would Jesus do? And you know what? That makes very good sense. When faced with situations and decisions, even as we look to the Lord for guidance to make the right choices, we can imagine Jesus in that situation and think, how would Jesus act? What would he say? What choice would he make? Or even some of the apostles and prophets, what, what would they do? What would Paul do in this situation? What would John the Apostle do? What would Elijah do in this situation? When we're surrounded, perhaps, by enemies and we're faced with very difficult situations, would we still obey God or would we run from it like, like um, Jonah did? Or would we turn back and stop following him as the disciples in John 6 did? Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight that cloud of witnesses is those who did endure, who left a good example for us. Praise your name. And the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's joy set before us. Will we endure the this, this, the suffering, perhaps, and the uncomfortableness that, that is on that path, that is part of the path that leads to that joy. Yes, I believe part of that cloud of witnesses is those godly patriarchs, prophets, and apostles who did run their race well, who heard those words, well done, good and faithful servant, when they pass from this life, and they'll receive inheritance in the world to come. Praise your name. Maybe we follow their example. And of those, again, by Joshua and Caleb, who serving God with their whole hearts, it is said of Joshua and Caleb, Caleb, were the only two out of approximately two million adult Israelites who had been saved from Egypt that entered into their inheritance. The land had been promised to all 
who were set free from bondage. Yet most, although they had been saved and given God's word, they did not receive the promise. And this is true of us as well. He swore to give them the land of Canaan. Yet it didn't happen for the vast majority of those to whom the promise was given. He has promised a kingdom to those of us he has saved from bondage to sin. Will that promise be fulfilled? It will be if we obey his command to walk in his way. But if we refuse and follow the example of those in the wilderness, we will not. Let me read this passage from uh, Psalm 78. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power, the day when he redeemed them from the enemy. They didn't remember. They couldn't look back to the time that God had, had delivered them. And they thought, oh, he can't deliver us now. He delivered them from, the, from, the, uh, the, from bondage and from the Pharaoh and his army. But yet when they faced some minor thing in the wilderness, they all freaked out and they didn't think God could do what he had done before when he split the Red Sea for them. So easily we forget sometimes. The, the, the victories that God has won for us and the things that he has brought us into and we still complain. I still complain. God, I don't want to complain anymore. Um, verses 5 to 8. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel when he commanded our fathers that they should make him known to their children. That was another thing. They, they kept not passing on the truth of God to their children that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, suppose this heritage should be passed on, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright, and whose spirit was not faithful to God, there is so much. I, this is a parallel of what we're seeing today in our, in, in, in our society, in, in, even in our church. We've replaced a lot of the truth and commands of God with man-made traditions. And again, I, I don't agree with, honestly, I have written an article on it. It's on the website, Where Do I Belong? I, I don't agree with about 80%, at least, of what is of, of doctrine and theology is taught in churches today. I don't find it in the scripture, friends. I, I may do a, some video series one time on that, just looking at each one of these things that is presented, that is believed, that is taught week after week in the churches, that is contrary, sometimes 100% opposite of what the scripture teaches. And yet it's become Christian tradition. It's the things that we live by. It's the things that we're teaching our children. We're teaching them things opposite of the word of God. Praise your name. May we take these examples, the things that we're reading here, to heart and learn from them. Will we heed God's word or blatantly dismiss it as Jehoiakim? I believe we're running into a Jehoiakim period of time now in our nation. Jesus, help us to be Joshua and Caleb's. When all around us is falling apart, Jesus... Will we blatantly dismiss it as Jehoiakim, who burned the word of God written on the scroll by Jeremiah, warning the king of Israel and Israel of coming judgment if they refuse to repent? Will we, remain, will we remain on God's path and trusting him to fulfill his promise in his time and his way? Or will we look for a shortcut? Honestly, that's to me, the rapture is, is us hoping in a shortcut to get out of here. But... To, to be taken out of the trouble, which God never did for any of these, um, would be to defeat his purpose of proving and testing the saints that will inherit. Will we, will we be a good example to our children and to those around us? Paul wrote to exhort the elders and leaders of God's people to walk steadfastly in the way, capital W, and to be that godly example that will bring blessing upon both those under their charge and themselves as well, as well, ensuring they would receive their inheritance and reward in that day. Let me, let me finish with this. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, 
and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, not as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. This is yet to come. Will we walk as Jesus walked, as the disciples walked, and shepherd the flock of God? Those who have an opportunity to be a pastor or a priest or a teacher, will we be faithful in presenting the truth of God or will we teach Christian tradition?